Hi, I'm Garrett Yates of Backflow Management in Portland, Oregon. This presentation is going to be a demonstration of USC's 10th edition field test procedures. If upon viewing this you have any questions, please feel free to call us at 1-800-841-7689. I'm going to start with the reduced pressure principle backflow assembly. When we field test this assembly, we're evaluating three components, the pressure differential relief valve, the tightness of check valve number two, and the tightness of check valve number one. Now preliminary steps in the procedure require us to notify, identify, inspect, and observe. So first of all, I'm going to notify the customer, I'm going to test their backflow preventer. It is going to temporarily terminate water service to whatever's downstream. I'm going to identify the appropriate markings on the assembly and put them on my field test report. So a type, a size, make, model, serial number. I'm going to inspect the assembly for the components I need. I have a number one and a number two shutoff valve. Test cock one, two, three, four. Nothing looks like it's been modified to the point I can't test the backflow preventer. And then lastly, I'm going to observe the condition of the assembly. I always look for possible leaks in test cocks, a possible leak in valve packing, and maybe a relief valve that happens to already be open, or maybe even sometimes a wet spot underneath that relief valve are things I like to look for. So I'm going to get started with the test. So one of the things I always like to do, recommend, is make sure all of our needle valves are snug on our test kit before we start a field test. So I'm just going to make sure that that's done. Then I'm going to go ahead and flush the test cocks. The purpose of flushing the test cocks, of course, is just to eliminate any foreign material and make sure we have supply pressure at each of those individual uh, fittings. So I'm going to start by opening test cock 4 first. This induces flow through the backflow preventer. It would make this relief valve less sensitive to any pressure fluctuations causing it to open up. Then we'll go ahead and open 3, open 2, Then I'm going to close one, close two, close three, and close four. Then I'm going to go ahead and attach my high side hose to test cock two. The low side hose would attach to test cock three. So we're hooking these high and low hoses on either side of check valve one. So for the entire procedure, we're going to be observing the apparent condition of that check valve one. Now I'm going to go ahead and pressurize the low side of my test kit by opening up test cock 3 fully. Then I'm going to go ahead and open up my low bleed needle valve just to establish flow through the test kit, eliminate any air, and leave that running. While that's running, I'm going to go ahead and slowly pressurize the high side of my test kit. Now I want to go slow here because I don't want to exercise my relief valve. So I'm fully opening test cock 2 to pressurize the high side of my test kit. Then I'm going to go ahead and open up my high bleed needle valve. So I've got both those bleeds open, just getting the air out of the test kit. Now while those are flowing, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and close shutoff valve number two. And what's significant about that is my goal is to put the assembly in a no-flow condition after these bleeds are closed. Then I'm going to go ahead and close my high bleed needle valve, so my gauge rises towards the high end of the scale, and then close my low bleed needle valve. Now at this point we've established the apparent pressure differential across check valve one and it's always good to make sure our gauge remains stable. Continuing with the test procedure is dependent upon our gauge remaining stable at this point. If the gauge started to steadily descend to the low end of the scale and the relief valve was steadily open, most likely to have a problem with my check valve number one. But the first component I'm actually going to perform a test of is the pressure differential relief valve. The relief valve shall open before the pressure differential across check valve 1 is no less than 2 PSID. So to test the relief valve, I'm going to go ahead and open up the high control needle valve. And what this does is it allows high pressure to be spread across this manifold. Because what I'm then going to do is transfer that high pressure down the low hose into the zone of reduced pressure to get the relief valve to open. So I'm going to go ahead and perform that. I'm going to put my hand underneath my relief valve. Go ahead and just slightly crack that low control, no more than a quarter turn. The gauge should begin to steadily equalize, and I'm just going to keep a hand under that relief valve and uh, get an opening on that relief valve there. There it goes. 3.8 PSID, it seemed that that relief valve started to steadily dis uh, discharge, and um, because that's 2 PSID or greater, the relief valve 
operated properly. So I'm going to close the low control needle valve. The high control needle valve stays open to maintain high pressure in this manifold. The next component I'm going to go ahead and test is the tightness of check valve number two. So to perform that test, we're going to go ahead and bleed our bypass hose, attach our bypass hose to test cock four, and then I want to go ahead, of course, and um, open up test cock four. All right, so now I have a clear pathway to actually back pressure check valve number two. But before I back pressure the check, I'm going to go ahead and open my low bleed needle valve to just reestablish the pressure differential across check valve one because I had just um, altered that value. So open up the low bleed needle valve long enough for my gauge needle to rise above the apparent pressure differential, which it has done. Now I'm actually ready to back pressure check valve two. Now at this point, we're still observing the pressure differential across check valve one. But while observing that pressure differential across check valve one, we are going to introduce transfer high pressure behind check valve two. And what we're looking at is how does it affect the pressure differential across check valve one. So if I bring this back pressure behind check valve two and the gauge needle remains above the relief valve opening point, check valve two can be considered to be tight. So by opening up this bypass control needle valve, that's when I'm actually going to transfer this pressure behind check valve two. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And of course, it doesn't look like a great deal happened, but I did transfer that high pressure behind check valve two. And of course, the procedure states that if the gauge needle remains above the relief valve opening point, we have a tight number two check valve. So based on the fact that my gauge needle is remaining stable there, I'm going to say check valve two appears to be tight. Now, it's appropriate to look at the static pressure differential across check valve one. And what's significant here is I'm going to maintain this back pressure on the back side of check valve two. So this one final evaluation is going to lift check one. After I lift check one, I'm going to allow check one to reclose, and I'm going to observe what the pressure differential is across that number one check valve. So to lift that number one check valve, the very last part of the procedure is to go ahead and open that low bleed needle valve so the gauge needle rises above the apparent pressure differential across that check. I'm going to go ahead and close it. Now I've maintained this bypass control needle valve in the open position to keep the back pressure on the back side of check two. And the last thing I want to do is observe this gauge reading. And I'm going to step in here for a quick moment. My gauge appears to be stable at 9.5 PSID. So check valve one is maintaining a static pressure differential across it of 9.5 PSID. So I've evaluated those three components on this backflow preventer. So to conclude the test, we're going to go ahead and close our test cocks. And then I like to take the pressure off my test kit by opening up my bleeds. That way, of course, when I remove my gauge hoses, I might get a little less spray. And lastly, I'm going to go ahead and restore the customer's water service by slowly opening the number two shutoff valve. And that would conclude the test. The next demonstration is going to be the field test of the double check valve assembly. During this evaluation, what we're looking at is the tightness of two check valves. Each one of the check valves shall close drip tight against at least one PSI. A couple other considerations are this is a one hose test method. So at this point, it's important to only have the high side hose on your test kit and the bypass and low hose removed, or you can also wrap them tightly around the body of the gauge. I usually prefer to just have my high side hose present. The other pertinence that's going to be attached to your high side hose is a bleed off valve arrangement. This is utilized in the event that you encounter a shutoff leak. The other thing to consider is the elevation of your gauge. Because we're only using the high side hose, the elevation of your gauge can affect your gauge readings. So, during the test of the number one check, if test cock three rises above check one, we would maintain our test kit, the center line of our test kit, at the same height as test cock number three. During the second test of check valve two, 
If the number four test cock rises above check valve two, we could maintain the center line of our test kit at the same height as test cock four. Sometimes, if the assembly is installed below ground, or maybe the test cocks come off the side of the body, then it might become important to attach a piece of tube, a vertical tube to that downstream test cock. So you'll see how I utilize this in the demonstration. Although these test cocks are situated um, in a manner that I wouldn't need to use the vertical tube, I'm going to go ahead and use it, again, just for demonstration purposes. So to begin the field test procedure, as always, we'd notify, identify, inspect, and observe, and then I'd begin to flush my test cocks. On the double check, we just flush test cock one, two, three, four. So here's test cock one, two, three, four, shut off one, and shut off two. So I'll begin the field test. And on these test cocks, we're just opening and closing them. None of them need to remain open. All right, I've got the bleed off valve attached to the high side hose. I'm going to attach the high side hose to test cock number two. And because I'm going to demonstrate the use of the vertical tube, I'm going to go ahead and attach that to test cock three. Now, since I've attached this and I'm going to utilize this in the demonstration, what's important is during this field test, the test kit, the center line of the test kit, needs to be maintained at the same height as the water in this tube. So I've set this, of course, up to where my center line of my test kit looks just about right. So I wish it was always that convenient in the field. Now I'm going to go ahead and pressurize my test kit. Before I do that, I always like to make sure all my needle valves on my kit seem to be snug. Okay. Um, then go ahead and pressurize the high side of your test kit. Gauge will rise to the high end of the scale there. And as always, when we pressurize the side of our test kit, we're going to open up that corresponding bleed. So I'm going to go ahead and crack that high bleed needle valve just to get any air out of um, the, the test kit there. And I'm going to go ahead and close that. So my gauge is pressurized. It's bled. It's ready um, to uh, assist me with the evaluation. Then I'm going to go ahead and since I've incorporated the tube, I'm going to go ahead and fill the tube. If I didn't have to incorporate the tube, I wouldn't um, go ahead and fill it. Of course, I would just omit that step. So really, my gauge is pressurized. It's bled. I've got appropriate amount of water in my tube. I'm ready for my evaluation. I'm going to then close shutoff valve number two. And before I close shutoff valve number one, this is where it's important to make sure that height of your test kit's appropriate. So again, that looks about right. Then I'm going to go ahead and close shutoff valve number one. So here's the idea with this test. My pressure on the front side of my check valve number one is just over 40 PSI. Maybe we're at 45 PSI or so. So I've got about 45 PSI on the front side of check one. Now, with both these shutoffs closed, the idea here is check valve one should be in the closed position. But what I'm going to do to evaluate, will this check close drip tight against at least one PSI, is I'm going to open test cock three fully. By opening test cock three fully, I'm going to flow that 45 PSI across check valve one and out of that open test cock downstream. But again, if this check valve is healthy, it should close drip tight against at least one PSI when downstream of the check valve is open to atmosphere, so the pressure there is known to be zero. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Slowly but completely open test cock three. You'll see my gauge needle begin to descend. Test cock's fully open. Now, what I'm required to wait for is I want to wait for the water to stop flowing, stop running. If that water continuously flowed, it's likely I have a shutoff leak or maybe I haven't gotten a shutoff all the way closed. But you can see here my water stopped flowing. Then what I'm going to do is observe my gauge reading. And again, the gauge reading at this point shall be at least one PSID or greater. So I'm going to take a quick peek at my gauge, make sure it's stable. And I'm going to say that that gauge reading is stable, and I have a reading on that test kit right now of 2.5 PSID. So check valve one is tight at 2.5 PSID. Now I'm going to consider moving on and testing that second check valve. So I'm going to go ahead and close test cock two, close test cock three, and I'm going to do the exact same thing, but across the second check valve. So I'm going to take my vertical tube and move that on down to that number four test cock. High side hose with the bleed off valve attached goes on down to the number three test cock. 
I do have to restore pressure to the backflow preventer. Kind of making sure my test cocks are closed there. I'm going to go ahead and re reintroduce water into the, the backflow preventer there. Now I'm going to go ahead and repressurize my test kit and fill my tube. Open up test cock three. Should repressurize my test kit here. Gauge rises to the high end of the scale. Again, I'm going to open up my high bleed needle valve. Just make sure I got any air out of the system. Close that bleed back down. And then I'm going to go ahead and open up test cock four to fill the tube. I'm going to overflow that tube just a touch, make sure I got all the air out of the system. All right. Now I'm ready to evaluate, again, check valve number two. So my gauge needs to be maintained at that appropriate elevation before I, again, close shut off valve number one. So we got that same scenario set up where I've got this pressure on the front side of check valve two, which looks roughly to be over 40 PSI, around 45 PSI. But again, what's going to happen when I open up test cock four is I'm actually going to flow water across that check. I'm actually allowing that check to open. Water flows across the check, but again, if the check is healthy, it's going to close and hold at least one PSI on the front side of it when downstream of it's open to atmosphere. So I'm going to go ahead and open up test cock four, slowly but fully. You can see my gauge needle descending there. I got that test cock fully open. And we're just patient in the field and wait for the water to stop running, because again, if that water continuously flowed, I may have a shutoff leak. So I do want to make sure that water stops running. Then I can read my gauge. Okay, so it looks like I got that water stopped there. I'm going to look at my gauge here. And again, that gauge seems to be stable at 2.5 PSID, with the minimum being 1. So I'm going to say that check valve 2, again, tight, 2.5 PSID. So this assembly would pass the field test. Now to conclude the test, we're going to go ahead and close test cock 3. Go ahead and close test cock 4. Remove my equipment. Then I'm going to go ahead and reestablish service. I'm going to open shutoff valve number 1 and then give that customer their water back by slowly opening shutoff valve number 2. And that concludes this field test. The next demonstration is going to be the field test of the pressure vacuum breaker assembly. During this test, our two evaluations are of the air inlet opening. The air inlet shall open before the pressure beneath it is less than 1 PSI. And then we're going to evaluate a check valve, very similar to the double check. We're going to make sure that check valve closes drip tight against at least 1 PSI. So as usual, I'd always notify, identify, inspect, and observe. And then as part of this field test, of course, we're going to remove the canopy so we can properly evaluate the air inlet opening. Then I'm going to go ahead and flush the test cocks. Uh, just to look at the anatomy of this real quick, we've got shutoff valve number one, shutoff valve number two, a number one test cock, and a number two test cock. So I'm going to go ahead and flush test cock one, flush test cock two, Okay, now we're going to go ahead, following procedure, attach the bleed-off valve arrangement. In the event we had a shutoff leak on a pressure vacuum breaker, it would be appropriate to use this. We're going to attach that and leave it hanging on test cock one for the first test. But it's merely a decoration in this first evaluation because we're going to take our high side hose and connect it to the number two test cock. Now the idea with where we've connected this high side hose is just beneath the air inlet. So we can evaluate the pressure on the test kit when the air inlet pops open and allows air into the body of the assembly to break a vacuum. So that's where it's appropriate to attach the high side hose in that first test. Then we're gonna go ahead and pressurize our field test kit by opening up test cock two. So I'm gonna fully open that test cock two. My gauge then does rise to the high end of the scale, which you can see here. Then I'm gonna go ahead and open up my high bleed needle valve to go ahead and get any air out of the body of the test kit 
So high bleed's open here. Just making sure I get all the air out of there. Then I'm going to close that high bleed needle valve. My gauge is pressurized. It's bled. Really re ready to perform the test. Next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and close shutoff valve number two. And then before I close shutoff valve number one, it does become appropriate to make sure my gauge is at the appropriate level. Because again, it's a one hose test method. My bypass hose and low side hose are either taken off the body of the gauge or wrapped around. But also what becomes a consideration is where I put my field test kit before I close shutoff one. I want the center line of my gauge to be right at the same height as that air inlet valve, right about there. Then I'm going to go ahead and close shutoff valve number one. Now, the test of this air inlet is pretty basic. All I'm going to do is slightly crack my high bleed needle valve, no more than a quarter turn. And that's going to evacuate this pressure from beneath the air inlet. And again, if the air inlet's healthy, it should open before the pressure is less than one PSI. So I'm going to slightly crack this. You'll see my gauge begin to descend. I'm going to lightly put a finger on top of my air inlet, but really watch my gauge. And I'm going to watch for the point at which that gauge is slowly descending, but then drops to zero. That point at which the gauge suddenly drops to zero is that value I want to catch for my air inlet opening. So I'm going to go ahead and slightly crack that high bleed needle valve. Now granted, in the field, I'd like to stand straight on looking at my test kit, but I want to stay out of your way. But I'm just going to slightly crack that high bleed. Hey, the gauge is descending there. I want it descending nice and steady. I'm going to lightly put a finger on top of that air inlet. Hey, I'm at four pounds there. Coming on down. Three. There it went. Two and a half PSI, that air inlet seemed to pop open. Now before I commit that value to my test report, a second very important part of the air inlet evaluation is to then remove that high side hose. Because when air inlets open initially, they float. And what I need to make sure of as a backflow tester is once I've pulled this high side hose, drain the water from the body, I want to visually inspect the air inlet to ensure that it seems to be fully opening. Because sometimes there can be circumstances where this air inlet does not fully open. And the only way I know that this would effectively stop a vacuum is if the air inlet was fully open. So now that the water's done running, I've looked down in the body of this thing, and to the best of my ability, I can see that that air inlet seems to be fully open. So this air inlet is functioning properly. It opened above one PSI, and in fact opened at 2.5. So I'm done with the air inlet evaluation. So upon conclusion there, I'm going to go ahead and close that test cock. Co close my high side bleed, and then I'm going to go ahead and repressurize the assembly. Okay, so repressurize the assembly, and now I'm going to move on to test the check valve. So to test the check valve, this is the same exact way that we evaluate the check on the double check valve assembly. We're going to take our high side hose, connect it to the number one test cock, that waiting bleed off valve arrangement. This test cock is on the front side of the check. So again, I'm going to look at the pressure on the front side of the check when I open downstream of that check valve to atmosphere. And this check, performing properly, shall close drip tight against at least one PSI. So I've closed the high bleed, closed test cock two, I repressurize. The order there is not real significant because it won't affect the outcome of the test. We just need to do those things. So then I'm going to go ahead and repressurize the test kit. The gauge just rose to the high end of the scale. I'm going to open up my high bleed needle valve, get any air out of the body. Okay, so I've got my gauge pressurized, it's bled. I'm ready to evaluate the performance of this check valve. But before I go ahead and carry out that procedure, I need to have my gauge at the appropriate level. Now, the difference in where I'm going to put my gauge during the check valve test, I want to put the center line of my gauge at the same height as test cock valve number two. So um, right about here looks good. Then I'm going to go ahead and close that number one shut off. So again, the idea here is with the test kit hooked on the front side of the check, with the shutoffs closed, the check should be closed. 
But what I'm going to do to really see if that check will close drip tight against one PSI, I'm going to go ahead and open up test cock two. And this is going to flow. This pressure on the front side of the check, which seems to be around 45 PSI, by opening up test cock two, I'm flowing water across that check. So right now, if we could see inside of that backflow preventer, check, the check valve is open. We're flowing water across it. We're inviting all that water to flow across that check by opening test cock two. My air inlet opened, but I'm not concerned with an air inlet opening at this point because we've already evaluated our air inlet, so we can essentially ignore that at this point. What I want to do here is wait for this water to stop running. The water stopping tells me that I likely don't have a shutoff leak. So the water has stopped, and now I can read the pressure on my test kit. If the value is 1 PSID or greater, the check passes. So the water has stopped, I'm going to take that reading. It looks to be 2.7 PSI that I have on the front side of that check valve, so this check does pass at a reading of um, 2.7 PSID. So I evaluated the air inlet, the air inlet opened properly, check valve is holding tight, uh, 2.7 PSID. So to conclude the test, I'm going to go ahead and close my test cock to close one. The order there doesn't matter. I'm going to go ahead and remove my test kit, repressurize the assembly. I'm going to open up that number one shutoff valve first. Make sure my air inlet reseats properly. Slowly restore the customer service by opening that number two shutoff valve. And then of course replace that canopy in the field. And this concludes that evaluation. This demonstration will be of the field test of the spill resistant vacuum breaker assembly. Now it has the same two components as the pressure vacuum breaker assembly, however we test them typically in a different order. We're going to evaluate the check valve first, then the air inlet. Quick little anatomy check on the spill resistant vacuum breaker. We have a number one shutoff valve, a number two shutoff valve. We've got one test cock only on a spill resistant vacuum breaker. And then just rotating this slightly, you can see on the side of the body here is what's called the vent valve. We're going to use that um, to assist us in executing the procedure. But like always, upon field testing and assembly, I'm going to notify, identify, inspect, and observe. And then I'm going to go ahead and remove the canopy so I can effectively evaluate the opening of that air inlet. I'm then going to go ahead and proceed with flushing my test cock. Again, removing any foreign material, making sure we have supply pressure. And then I'm also required to just loosen that vent valve and, and make sure we have supply pressure there. All right, so um, loosen that up, got a spray of water, so I think we have supply pressure. I'm ready to begin my evaluation. This is also a one hose test method, so it's either um, wrapping the, the hoses tightly around the body of the, the gauge or just removing those unused hoses altogether. Again, my preference is usually just to remove the unused hoses. In the event that we ran into a, a, a shutoff leak on uh, this vacuum breaker, we're also incorporating a bleed off valve arrangement on our high side hose. Now our high side hose connects to the test cock, the only place we can connect that. Make sure all my needle valves on my test kit are snug. And then I'm going to go ahead and pressurize my test kit. I'm going to open up that test cock fully. My gauge does rise to the high end of the scale. And um, I'm going to then make sure I open my high bleed needle valve to evacuate any air out of the body of the gauge. And I'm going to go ahead and close that high bleed needle valve. And in fact, you know what I like to do, and I'm going to open that high bleed needle valve back up to do this, I'm going to put a puddle of water on top of that air inlet. That puddle of water really does help us see that air inlet open. So my gauge is pressurized and bled. I'm ready to begin the evaluation. Now, this is carried out in one procedure. The pressure vacuum breaker, we tested the air inlet first, then had to move a gauge hose and test that check valve. On the spill resistant vacuum breaker, because of the way it's designed, we're going to test this assembly essentially all in one procedure. I'm going to evaluate the check first, then the air inlet. So before I close my shutoff valves, um, I'm going to make sure my gauge is at the appropriate level. Now I could go ahead and just close shutoff valve number two, 
But before I close shutoff valve number one, I need to make sure I have my gauge at the appropriate level. So the appropriate level during this test is to maintain the center line of our test kit at the same height as the vent valve. So I'm gonna do that for both the check test and the air inlet test. So now it's appropriate to go ahead and close shutoff one. Now all I'm gonna to do to test the check, and this is the same exact test we perform on a double check or the pressure vacuum breaker assembly. I have my test kit hooked on the front side of the check valve. I'm gonna remove this vent valve, which is gonna flow water across the check. And if the check is healthy, it should close drip tight against at least one PSI. So that's the per first performance requirement um, I'm chasing is, how is this check valve gonna perform? However, depending on how well the check is holding, how high of a pressure the check is gonna hold, I may or may not see this air inlet open in the beginning of the procedure. So when I remove this vent valve, I'm actually gonna pay a little bit of attention to my air inlet. If he begins to open, I need to catch that value on my gauge. Then I would get the check reading. So sometimes depending on the check, maybe wear and tear or it's leaking altogether, I might see the air inlet open in the beginning of the procedure. If it's working properly, typically I won't see that. I'll end up having to do something additional to open um, my air inlet valve. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and begin to remove this vent valve. And again, this is gonna flow water across that check. Same as a double check, but instead of opening a test cock, we are just removing a screw from the body downstream of the check valve. So I'm gonna pay attention to that air inlet, make sure it doesn't pop open on me during this portion of the test. I'm not really gonna pay attention to my gauge at this point unless that air inlet does seem to pop open. Now I've removed that vent valve fully. The requirement is to make sure the water stopped flowing from the body, the vent opening, and then I could read my gauge for my check. My air inlet didn't open, water stopped flowing from the body. I'm gonna look at my test kit and I'm gonna remember for the time being that my test kit's stable at 3.9 PSID. So the check valve holds tight at 3.9 PSID. Because my air inlet hasn't opened, I'm then gonna need to slightly crack my high bleed needle valve, no more than a quarter turn. That's gonna take this 3.9 PSI beneath the check and evacuate it out of the body of the gauge, which should allow that air inlet to open. So I'm gonna slightly crack that high bleed, very, very slight on that, no more than a quarter turn. And I'm gonna now start to look at this air inlet. When this air inlet begins to open, this puddle's gonna to start to recede that I have up here. And water's also gonna come out of the vent opening at that point. So I'm just slightly cracking that. There's always a little bit of delay, so you wanna be real careful and not over open that thing. Now I'm looking for movement of that puddle. Which I'm starting to see it, there it goes. Air inlet's opening. I'm gonna call that 2.2 PSID that air inlet began to open. I started to lose my puddle, as well as water started to flow out of that vent opening. So 2.2 for that air inlet opening. Now, I'm not quite done with the air inlet evaluation. Again, similar to the pressure vacuum breaker, I wanna remove this high side hose, allow any remaining water to drain from the body, then look down in the body at that air inlet, and we wanna make sure the air inlet seems to be fully open. So I'm gonna say that, yep, to the best of my ability, I can see in there, and it appears that that air inlet is fully open. So this assembly performed properly. I had a check valve that held tight at 3.9 PSID. My air inlet fully opened at a 2.2. So again, I wanna work on getting the customer back their water. I'm gonna replace that vent valve. And I always like to repeat that in class, replace the vent valve, because when we open shut off one, that little hole gets people real wet. I'm gonna go ahead and replace the vent valve. Snug that up. Go ahead and close my test cock. All right, and then I'm going to slowly reintroduce water into the body of the assembly. Little difference there, I didn't have any leakage out of the top of the body. And then slowly restore that customer service. And of course, I'll take my bleed valve back with me. And then lastly, go ahead and refasten my canopy there in the field. And that concludes this evaluation. Thank you for watching this demonstration. If you have any questions, please give us a call at 1-800-841-7689. I've always maintained the best tool in my toolbox was a phone number. Thank you.